The Saturn V, the most powerful machine ever built, was a symphony of destructive force and precise engineering. But on its second uncrewed flight, Apollo 6, that symphony turned into a jarring mechanical scream. The rocket shook violently in a phenomenon they called pogo oscillation. As the first stage roared, the vehicle shook violently due to pogo oscillation, but all five F-1 engines completed their burn. Then, on the second stage, two of its J-2 engines shut down prematurely. The third stage's single J-2 engine, while getting them to Earth orbit, then failed to restart for its planned burn. This wasn't a clean failure. It was a messy, terrifying reminder that a machine built with millions of parts is a million opportunities for something to go wrong. The public watched and wondered, was the Saturn V ready? Was the entire Apollo program on the brink of collapse? For the mission's managers, it was a moment of profound stress. They were navigating a high-stakes gamble, a single, audacious decision made years earlier that was either going to win the moon or lose it all. It was a strategy called all-up testing, a high-stakes bet that a team of engineers with nothing but their knowledge and courage was willing to make. Back in 1961, when President Kennedy stood before Congress and declared that the United States would land a man on the moon and return him safely to Earth before the decade was out, he started a clock, a ruthless, unyielding timer that put NASA on a war footing. The engineers, led by the legendary Werner von Braun, knew how to build rockets. They had done it with the Redstone and the Saturn I. Their method was a textbook approach, incremental testing. You build a rocket stage, test it, prove it works, then add the next one. A gradual, methodical, and safe process. It was the engineering standard of the day, and it worked. The Saturn I program, for instance, flew a series of flawless tests but von Braun's plan for the Saturn V was a long one. First, they would fly a Saturn V with just the first stage. Then they would fly the first and second stages. Only after those had been proven would they add the third stage, the Apollo Command and Service Modules, and the Lunar Module. By von Braun's own conservative estimates, this process would take dozens of flights and many years. And with the Soviets nipping at their heels, years were a luxury they didn't have. Kennedy's deadline was a vice. In 1963, a man named George Mueller arrived at NASA. He was an outsider, a systems engineer from outside the traditional rocket building culture. He was a thinker, not a builder. And he looked at von Braun's plan and saw a problem of time and scale. He saw a team of the best minds in the world, and he believed they were smart enough to trust their designs. Mueller proposed something that sounded insane to the old guard, all-up testing. His idea was to fly the entire fully stacked Saturn V on its very first test flight. The three stages, the instrument unit, the command and service modules, even a mock-up of the lunar module, the whole nine yards. A rocket 110 meters or 363 feet tall, weighing nearly 3,000 metric tons or 6.6 .6 million pounds would fly all at once. This was a radical departure from everything they had ever done. While Von Braun, the meticulous planner, did resist initially, he and his team ultimately adapted to Mueller's management decision. Mueller's argument was simple. They had done their homework. 
The separate components had been meticulously tested on the ground. The engines were run for hours on test stands. The structures had been shaken and stressed. Mueller believed they had enough data to move forward. They had to. The alternative was to lose the race. It was a clash of cultures. The cautious, brilliant engineer versus the bold, visionary manager. Mueller prevailed, not because he was a better orator, but because the numbers, the simple, brutal math of the clock, were on his side. The first all-up test, Apollo 4, lifted off on November 9, 1967. The world held its breath. The Saturn V's five massive F-1 engines roared to life, generating 34 meganewtons, or 7.6 million pounds of thrust. The sound was so immense, it shook the press boxes and surrounding buildings. The first stage burned for two and a half minutes before separating, and then the second and third stages fired perfectly. The entire test was a stunning success. The rocket worked. All of it. But the gamble wasn't over. The next test, Apollo 6, was a near disaster. On April 4, 1968, the Saturn V lifted off, but within the first two minutes of flight, the dreaded pogo oscillations began. It was a terrifying low-frequency vibration that could tear the rocket apart. The sensors inside the rocket vibrated so violently that they triggered a premature shutdown of two of the five F-1 engines. The remaining engines had to burn longer to compensate. Then, on the second stage, two of the J-2 engines failed about two minutes into their burn. The third stage's single J-2 engine, while getting them to Earth orbit, then failed to restart for its planned burn. For many, this was a clear sign of serious issues. But Mueller and his team, with the benefit of the data, saw something different. The rocket had failed, yes, but it hadn't failed catastrophically. The redundant systems had worked. The rocket had compensated for the engine failures and still made it to orbit. It was a flawed test, but not a fatal one. They could fix the pogo issue. They could re-engineer the engine restart sequence. The core machine, the Saturn V, was fundamentally sound. They knew what they needed to do to get it right. They had their data. With the clock still ticking, and with the problems from Apollo 6 in hand, NASA made its greatest decision yet. A third all-up test, Apollo 8, was scheduled. The plan was to send the Saturn V and the Apollo spacecraft into a high Earth orbit. But the new plan was far more audacious. Following reports of Soviet progress and delays in readying the lunar module, the decision was made to send Apollo 8 all the way to the moon. On just the third Saturn V flight, they would send men Frank Borman, Jim Lovell, and Bill Anders on a journey to orbit another world. A journey that had never been attempted before. This was the ultimate expression of Mueller's gamble. They were putting the lives of three men on a rocket that had flown only twice and on its last flight had experienced significant issues. It was an act of faith, a belief that their analysis of Apollo 6 was correct and that their fixes would work. On December 21, 1968, the Saturn V lifted off flawlessly. The pogo oscillations were gone. The engine restarts were perfect. The rocket performed with surgical precision. It was a complete vindication of Mueller's vision. Just eight months after the near disaster of Apollo 6, three men were on their way to the moon, riding a rocket that had, by all accounts, just been through its shakedown.
The story of Apollo 8 isn't just a story about astronauts. It's a testament to the courage of the engineers and managers on the ground who made the hard, unpopular decisions. It was a high-stakes poker game, and they were willing to go all in with the Saturn V. Without all-up testing, Apollo would not have landed on the moon in 1969. The methodical, incremental approach would have pushed the deadline back years. The political will would have evaporated. The dream would have died. The Apollo program, with its impossible deadline, was a triumph of technology, but it was also a victory of risk management and the daring belief in human ingenuity. It was a triumph of the will to go all in when the stakes were the highest. In the end, the gamble paid off. The moon was won, not by incremental steps, but by a single, bold leap of faith. The men who made that decision deserve our deepest respect. They didn't just build a rocket, they built a legacy of courage.